So as always, we're going to start with a little history. And we got all of the Roman history. Now we're going to we're going to learn about the Byzantine Empire, which was from 330 to about 1453 of the Common Era. And in 330, the Roman Emperor Constantine moved the capital city from Rome to Byzantium, a Greek port city, renamed that city Constantinople, and it became the capital of the Byzantine Empire. You may know the city today. It is currently Istanbul in the country of Turkey. The move to Constantinople um, signaled the, the decline of the classic Roman Western Empire. And uh, Constantinople is located at the entrance of the Black Sea, and the city and its surrounding territories have both land and trade routes between the Western world, Central Asia, Russia, and the Near East. Um, and at, at the same time, it had the Balkans protecting it to the north that kept it safe from the German barbarians. Throughout the Middle Ages, uh, the Byzantine Empire uh, thrived because it was based on efficient, an efficient bureaucracy and a really sound economy. Um, you know, although trade and urban life pretty much ceased to exist with the Western cities of Rome and, and those on the Italian Peninsula, the Byzantine Empire flourished because of it, its extensive trading with um, Eastern and Middle Eastern countries. In spite of constant pressure from hostile forces, the Byzantine Empire survived until 1453 when the city of Constantinople um, and the remains of its once powerful empire fell to, to the Turks. And, and that's why the country is now called Turkey. And, you know, in its history of more than a thousand years, um, it developed an artistic and intellectual atmosphere in which styles and ideas from both sides of the East and West were merged. First, let's talk about the social structure um, of, of the Byzantine Empire. And the, the emperor, the Byzantine emperor, was an absolute political ruler and head of the Eastern Church, which at this time, Christianity was the official religion of the Byzantine Empire. And there was a, a nobility that made up an important element of government and economic life. Uh, but there also was a well-developed civil service and wealth rather than bloodline determined your status. In such a, a long period of history, the status of women, um, it, it went through some changes. It had some fluctuations. So in the earlier period of the, of the empire, the status of women was more advanced um, than in the later period when um, you know, ideas from the Near East were more predominant. Um, so there was a point in time where empresses reigned alone or um, as regents for their sons, and many of them exercised great power. Although the status of women were in flux, um, the Byzantine Empire had a very developed and detailed regulation about who were what and when. And based on the regulations, they did have some sumptuary laws that actually assigned colors and garments to wear based on your social status. And in Byzantine artwork, individuals wearing the same color stand next to one another in assigned positions um, that state their status. So where are we getting our, our documents from, right? So throughout its history, the city of Constantinople, Constantinople was the center, in my air quotes, right, of the preservation of antique, so the Greek and the Roman, of antique culture, so writing and works of art were actively preserved. However, as the empire declined and was constantly invaded, many of these artifacts were destroyed. However, many were saved and carried off to other cities. So we're going to look at one piece of architecture that um, still exists it's, it exists today. This is um, the Hagia Sophia. Um, it's a cathedral of holy wisdom. Actually, it's now a, a, a Muslim. It's now a mosque now. And it was constructed by the emperor Justin, Justinian. And it represented the first example and one of the finest examples of Byzantine Empire. And it was built with a complex system of vaults and, and domes. Much of our source documents, again, is, is from, from art of the Byzantine era. And Byzantine art has a, a strong religious motif. And religious art was favored over, you know, realistic representations of people. So, you know, early Byzantine artists depicted evangelists in, in um, traditional, traditional garments. So a lot of the images that we see do have more of a religious flair. 
So with all these representations, mostly being of religious backgrounds, we do know that Byzantine uh, wove fine textiles. And from the 4th century to the 6th century, linen and wool predominate were predominant, not really surprising because we've, we've seen those in our other in our other civilizations. But gradually the knowledge of silk was um, began to spread westward. Byzantine historians report that in the 6th century, a pair of monks brought the secret of sericulture, which we've learned is uh, silk production, to the, to the emperor. And these monks supposedly smuggled a handful of silkworm eggs out of China in hallowed out bamboo um, staffs, so basically out of, in their canes, um, and learned how to feed, breed, and raise silkworms. From the 6th to the 9th century, the Byzantines were the only ones producing silk in the Western world, and the emperor actually controlled that production and charged enormous prices for, for the fabric. So, of course, we know that only the wealthiest of the wealthy could afford, afford the fabric. And the fabric was made into garments and wall hangings that might be adorned with precious stones or semi-precious stones um, just to show the ostentatiousness. Sources reveal that clothing was quite expensive in the Byzantine Empire, and through documents that still exist today, examination of wills, it was found that clothing was often passed down, not only to family members, but also to slaves and domestic servants. So while there was a lack of money, um, that lack restricted the number of garments owned, there was a, an understanding of the fineness of the garments that you did own. So what did they wear? The basic garment for men was, surprise, surprise, the tunic, right? And tunics were either short, ending below the knee, or long, reaching the ground. Um, but long sleeve sleeves did predominate. Um, and Byzantine art shows, you know, emperors, including the emperor Justinian and other officials, in tunics that uh, end below the knee. And, and later, important course, court officials seemed to have full-length tunics. Based on the depiction, you know, tunics were decorated again um, with the clavi, right? So those stripes that originated in Roman dress on the side of the tunic that were ornamental. Um, and tunics of the wealthy were decorated with vertical and horizontal bands that were elaborately patterned with woven designs and embroideries and appliques and even precious stones. In the early part of the empire, fabrics were usually plain in color and artisans decorated the clavi and banding. And as Eastern influences gained favor, fabrics were developed with more overall pattern patterning. Um, but working men generally wore, you know, shorter tunics and plainer, less uh, ornamented fabrics um, that allowed for them to have greater mobility. Some of the ornamentation that became indicative of a wearer status included circular motifs called rondelles or rectangular or star-shaped decorative medallions known as segmentae and they were placed on different areas of the tunic. During the early Byzantine Empire, women continued to wear the Roman tunic and pala, but gradually the wide long sleeve tunic called the dalmatic, decorated with clavi and segmentae, replaced these outer tunics. And women generally wore the dalmatic over an under tunic that had more closely fitted sleeves. Um, they wore a simple veil that replaced the pala for a time, and eventually the pala returned with some modifications which, in which it was wrapped around the body. From the 4th to about the 10th century, men tended to be clean-shaven, but later uh, men, men tended to have beards, which was a trend across the classical world. Women, however, uh, tend to show their hair parted in the center with soft waves, raming their face and the bulk of their hair pulled back uh, in, in knotted, in knotted. Uh, behind their neck, and of course, <laughs> covered with uh, covered with the pala. Since we are getting all of our depictions from artwork that is essentially of religious or high standing individuals, jewels seem to be an integral part of dress. So, empresses wore wide jewel collars over their tunics. Um, they yeah, important jewelry included pins and earrings and braces and rings and other types of necklaces and. Jewelers were skilled in the techniques of working gold, setting stones, enameling, and making mosaics. 
Okay, so that's where we're going to leave uh, the Byzantine Empire off. And next we're going to move on to uh, some of the Germanic tribes that help institute the fall uh, and talk about some other cultures in the early Middle Ages.